Hi, and welcome to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most out of attending today's webinar. If you're experiencing technical issues, please let us know about those using the chat box or by emailing me at krogers at ASPB.org. If you're having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. If you have questions during today's webinar, please let us know about those using the GoToWebinar chat box. Today's talks will each be 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions. Jürgen Kleinven, who is an associate professor at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, is with us today to moderate your questions and read them aloud to our panelists. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. This webinar is part of our new virtual research talk series that we created in the response to the closure of most universities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please visit our webpage for more information and sign up if you'd like to be considered as a speaker. You can find us on social media at plante.org and at ASPB. For those of you listening to this as a recording, feel free to reach out on Twitter with follow-up questions or comments using hashtag Plante Presents. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm now going to turn it over to Jürgen to introduce our speakers and moderate today's session. Thank you, Katie. Um, well, welcome everybody that uh, is watching this live or is, is uh, looking at the recording of this. And uh, if you follow Dolph Weyers on, on Twitter, maybe um, you have seen him canceling just now a life science meeting. Uh, using a, a YouTube movie. So this is the way how we usually experience these virtual events, right? I mean, we get cancellations of, of the real uh, life events. And many of us start to truly miss real life interaction and um, virtual meetings, of course, cannot compensate for it. Um, I feel the same. It's, of course, much nicer to sit with friends um, or colleagues in a nice Italian restaurant than, uh, let's say, getting a delivery pizza. Um, but on the other hand, well, if we don't compare the delivery pizza with a with a networking event, um, um, it's a quite useful addition to our way of living. And just like this, uh, it's a pity that uh, we are right now not meeting Dolph Weyers and uh, Dana McGregor in person. But I'm still really happy that um, they are going to deliver some really nice signs to us today. Um, and as I said, meeting people in um, in real life is is important. And I was lucky to meet Dolph already in 2002 as a student. Uh, when he actually, I think that was also the year when he defended his PhD and he started the postdoc um, with uh, Gerd Jürgens in Tübingen. Um, and since then, Dolph is really a great source of inspiration for me, and I'm sure his presentation today will, will greatly reflect on this. Um, and just four years later, already in 2006, Dolph established his own lab um, at Wageningen University. Initially, he focused on uh, auxin signaling and how it contributes to cell identity in the embryo. By now, he climbed up the ladder in, in Wageningen and uh, he's chairholder of the biochemistry in, in Wageningen. Um, and his, his group covers an impressive array of uh, research questions, bridging biochemistry and structural biology uh, with cell and uh, developmental biology. And, and they do this uh, in, in a truly unique way. Um, Dolph recently received a, a very well-deserved uh, ESC advanced grant to focus on uh, questions uh, about cellular polarization and uh, today he will share some insight about this ongoing project uh, discussing cell polarity across multicellular kingdoms with us and with this uh, Dolph I, I would like to thank you once again uh, for joining us today and uh, please take this virtual stage. Well thank you so much Jürgen and uh, Katie and all others for first of all for for creating this fantastic venue for us to at least get excited about science in these crazy times. Um, I'm really glad to be able to present our work here. 
And, uh, but before I do that, I would actually like all of you to take 10 seconds to locate the northeastern corner of the room that you find yourself in and move an object there. I will start counting. That's 10 seconds. Now that sounds like a really trivial task. You need to find that corner, which means you need information. And maybe some of you quickly checked on your phone to, to uh, where you have a compass, or maybe you know where the sun comes up and goes down, so you have information of where the northeast is. But then you needed to actually go to that corner and then put it put an object there, which means you needed to use the information of where the corner is and actually go there. Now this sounds like a trivial task if you have information, but now imagine that you're a plant cell. And you need to figure out where a corner is. Actually, use that information to, for example, uh, position a cell division plane. Now, this is a question or a problem that is absolutely fundamental to multicellular biology because every cell in a multicellular organism will find itself relative to some polar information, some axes, outer, inner, upper, lower, proximal, distal, you name it. And somehow, that information uh, of the entire organism needs to be translated to individual cell information, which means that polarity of cells needs to be established and that needs to reflect the polarity of the organ. Secondly, that information needs to be integrated into the decisions that the cells make, such as, for example, defining the polarity or of the division plane or any other uh, differentiation you can think of. Now, this is something that is, as I said, common to multicellular organisms, and as you can imagine, in animal biology, this is something that has been studied in great detail. In humans and, and other animal models, uh, there's, there's been a lot of investigation which led to good, form well-formulated models on uh, epithelial polarity, on planar cell polarity, and also on symmetry breaking in fungi. Now, there's many genes that have been associated with these processes and that are absolutely critical for cells to define their axis of polarity and to respond to that. What is quite interesting is that even though in plants polarity is there and it's, it's very important, um, when the genomes of the first plants were sequenced, it was very obvious that the components that are in, involved in polarity in animals are essentially missing in plant genomes. So the notion has been that plants have invented their own systems for cell polarity. Now, of course, that is a question uh, which uh, I hope to also add a little bit to in today's seminar. Now, of course, there has been a lot of investigation of polarity in plants, and you may be familiar with the famous PIN1 oxineflex carrier that I'm showing on this slide here. Many labs have contributed excellent work to understanding how polarization uh, of that efflux carrier and a number of other proteins depicted here is actually happening in cells. Now, I, I would call these clients of the polarity system. They use the polarity system, but they're not actually regulating cell polarity. On the other hand, some labs, including Dominic Bergman, whose, whose example basil I'm showing here, have isolated components that are actually regulators of cell polarity. And of course, these are then important to make sure that cells polarize and that other proteins can follow suit, uh, as for example, uh, in asymmetric cell division. Now, what I think is important to realize when looking at this slide is that while there's a wealth of information, so far no conserved or universal mechanism has emerged. So for example, it's unclear uh, if there's any protein that is polarly localized across land plants, whether there are deep origins of the polarity system. And this is again where I hope to contribute a bit of the talk today. Now, the reason that I'm speaking about this is that rather fortuitously, a number of years ago, we stumbled into a new polar polarity system that I would like to speak about. And we stumbled into it as we were studying early Arabidopsis embryogenesis, which I'm showing you on this slide. Now, those of you that know me will realize that I'm a fetishist. I, I really love this system. I've, I've fallen in love with it more than 20 years ago, and I still am very much in love with it. And why is that? That's because it is actually, a, plant development in an absolute nutshell. So this starts from a single cell and bit by bit, cell division by cell division, new identities are established. And by this time here, you can start to recognize the later organs of the seedling. In the different colors, you can see the different identities of cell types that are established along the way. And you can also see that about every cell division, new identities are established. And in the past um, well, years, 
uh, my team has contributed to understanding how a number of different identities are being established uh, as embryogenesis progresses. But lately, we've also come to see that this is also a very nice system to understand how cell division and cell polarity are established, because that is, of course, established from scratch as the new embryo forms. And uh, what I'll show you is uh, to start with some work that a former graduate student in the lab, Cheyang Liao, did, where he asked the question, when is polarity actually established? And what he did is he took proteins that are known to be either localized in the outer or in the inner membrane of cells if you express them post-embryonically. He expressed them in embryogenesis and asked when do they first polarize. And as you can see here, the moment there is a physical asymmetry between outer and inner membrane, both of these proteins localize to the correct membrane, which means that polarity is present as soon as physically possible. Now, work from a former postdoc in the lab, Saiko Yoshida, showed us that this polarity information is probably also used to, to define where cell division uh, is going to occur. What she found is that under default conditions, so without any regulations, plant cells will choose the minimal surface uh, area uh, through the center of the cell to, to make a symmetric division. This is the default division. Now, if there is regulation, for example, by the hormone auxin, cells can deviate from this minimal surface area and divide asymmetrically. Uh, in this case, you can see that the, the asymmetric divisions here perfectly reflect the polarity axis that we can see by, per, by the means of these uh, markers here. So there is polarity and it is probably used to guide cell division orientation, which I think makes this a really beautiful system to understand how this works. Now, um, the way that we entered this uh, from a more mechanistic perspective is by asking which genes might be involved in setting up polarities early in the embryo. And the way we did this was by using a little trick. We used an inhibitor of auxin response. And when you express this in different places in the embryo, you can see all kinds of developmental decisions going wrong. Now, this is a transcriptional inhibitor. So we're interfering with gene expression. And when we express this inhibitor of auxin response very locally in a few cells of the embryo, no root is formed. And when we isolate these embryos, we can, of course, determine by transcriptome analysis which genes are associated with the inability to make an embryonic root. Now, when we do this, we get tons of genes that are misregulated, downregulated. And the story today is about one of these genes. It was the second most strongly downregulated gene, and it encodes a domain of unknown function. There's many of these, and that is not by itself a very exciting property or quality. But what makes this gene or this protein interesting is its localization. When we localize this protein in the embryo, what we found is that this domain of unknown function protein localizes to the upper outer corner of cells in the embryo. And as this will turn around in a second, you'll see that this localization in every cell, this upper outer localization, converges onto concentric rings of protein localization. So in other words, there is a coordinated polar localization in the corners of cells of this protein. And that we felt is very interesting. Now, when we look post-embryonically, we find that that upper outer localization is actually maintained in the primary root. This protein, this uh, domain of unknown function protein is not alone in the Arabidopsis genome. There are four homologs. We called this first gene Suseki-1 for the Japanese word for cornerstone. And there are four homologs, which we call Suseki-2 uh, through 5. And now, we localized all of these proteins, and the short of it is that all of them are polarly localized. But I'll show one example, which is Suseki-2. Instead of being upper-outer, this one is lower-inner. So that's the polar opposite of the localization pattern. And what it tells us is that this is really a new family of polar proteins with rather unique uh, localization properties. Now, if you see these two localization patterns, you could think, well, this one is uh, upper outer because it's in vascular cells, and this one is in lower inner because it's in endodermal cells. So it might be the tissue that directs the polarity. To, to ask whether that is the case, we expressed each of the proteins everywhere and found that Soseki 1 always finds the upper corner and so Sekis 2 always finds the lower corner. So it's the intrinsic property of the proteins to be polarly localized. And we can even swap that polarity with a very small uh, region of the protein. 
Now, in contrast to many other positive proteins that have been reported, the localization of these proteins is insensitive to hormones, drugs that interfere with trafficking or with cytoskeleton regulation. But instead, the localization is exquisitely sensitive to interfering with cell wall properties, such as uh, wall digestion or osmotic treatment. So we feel that this might actually reflect some mechanical or wall-dependent property, this localization. Now, what is this protein? It has a domain of unknown function, and for a long time we had no idea what it might be, until a former grad student, Maritza van Dopp, did a hidden Markov model-based homology search for proteins that might resemble this. And what she found was a domain of a protein called disheveled, uh, and the domain was a Dix domain, and you'll hear more about that in a bit. But this disheveled is actually very exciting, because it is a very famous regulator of polarity, in animals, and I'm showing you here Drosophila as an example, where you can see that in thoracic crystals are in all different directions. But more importantly, the disheveled protein is coordinately polarly localized in the epithelium of the fly. So what we have here is a, two proteins in different kingdoms that have similar localization and that share potentially a Dix-like domain. Now, does this domain contribute to, to the properties of the protein? It absolutely does, because normally, when we overexpress Soseki 1, we get polarity of, of localization, but also oblique cell divisions that you can see here. When we remove this dix like domain from the Soseki protein, it's no longer polar, and it can no longer induce altered cell division orientation. So let's summarize up to this point. What I showed you is that global polarities of tissues can be, are reflected in individual cell polarities. Furthermore, I showed you that Soseki proteins can interpret this polarity information and potentially translate it to division orientation. And finally, I showed you that plant and animal polarity proteins may share this Dix-like domain. And now, of course, the question is, is this something that is idiosyncratic for Arabidopsis or is this perhaps a more general property of plants? And to address that question, uh, a postdoc, current postdoc, previously a PhD student in the lab, Suman Thmute, developed um, or used the phylogenomics pipeline to, uh, to um, address the deep phylogeny of Soseki proteins in plants. And he used a pipeline that he had previously used in the context of his work on oxygen response. Now, he used a 1, uh, 000, more than 1,000 plant transcriptomes from the 1KP project, as well as uh, all land plant genomes that were available at that moment. And the bottom line is that all land plant genomes encode at least one Soseki protein. It was never lost, as far as we can tell. Now, inferring the ancestral state, so the number of genes that were around when this, uh, when this uh, clade split off, uh, what uh, Suman found was that up until the origin of the ferns, there was one copy of the Soseki, which then only diverged or duplicated later during land plant evolution. And this, of course, gives us a fantastic entry point by studying the bryophytes uh, to address what the ancestral property of that Soseki protein must have been. And this is something that Maritza van Dopp did together with our colleagues at Cell Biology and Wageningen University, Jeroen and Marcel, where we used Fiscometrella patents as a model system for a MOS. Now, Fiscometrella has duplicated then one uh, bryophyte Soseki protein to nine uh, copies, and we localized a few of these. Um, and we were super excited to see that at least one of them is coordinately polarly localized uh, in the MOS gametophore, very much like the Arabidopsis localization. Well, you could argue this is only one of nine, and maybe it's a derived property, which is why we resorted to Marcantia polymorpha, which has only one Soseki. And this is where Katharine Albrecht in the lab localized the single Marcantia Soseki. And you probably don't need convincing to see that this is also coordinately polarly localized. So I think we can safely state that the ancestral state of the Soseki proteins is polar and that it's very, very deeply conserved in land plants. Now, what about beyond? Suman also looked at the occurrence of that domain, the Dix domain, uh, and Soseki proteins in a broader um, range of, of organisms. And what he found is that Sosekis are limited to land plants. They're not found outside the land plants, not in uh, green algae, for example. But what he also found was that the domain that defines the family, this Dix-like domain, it actually is found in other proteins, including, of course, disheveled, and other components in uh, planar cell polarity, 
but also in some of the straminopile and alveolates, including uh, Phytophthora. So the domain is very old. And then the question, of course, is whether that domain performs a similar function in the different uh, uh, proteins that have it. Now, what is that Dix domain? This Dix domain is a polymerization domain, as you can see in the crystal structure here, that was uh, developed by Marianne Beans' group and her postdoc Mark Fiedler in Cambridge. And Marianne is truly one of the uh, pioneers in disheveled and Dix domain biology. And when I contacted her, uh, she was very uh, keen on collaborating with us to see if outside of the United Kingdom there would be proteins that have a similar property. Um, and what, one of the first things Mark did was to, uh, was to actually show that the plant dicks like domains actually polymerize. In this assay, we can measure the size of the polymers and we find that all of these domains actually make polymers. Now, very importantly, the size of the polymer is the scales with the concentration of the protein. So this is a concentration dependent polymerization, which is also very typical of the Sheveld and other Dix domain proteins. So next up, Mark managed to crystallize the uh, Arabidopsis soseki Dix domain. And you see an overlay here with the human uh, disheveled Dix domain. And they're hard to tell apart. But more strikingly, if we look at the uh, higher order structure, both of these form almost identical protein oligomers. So these are really structurally very, very similar domains in plants and in this case, human. Now we next managed to generate a version of the soseki in Arabidopsis that cannot oligomerize. So this is a monomeric soseki. And we uh, made the same mutation in the context of the plant. And what we saw is that when we do that, we lose the polar localization of the protein and we also lose the ability of the overexpressed protein to interfere with cell division orientation. So in other words, oligomerization is absolutely critical for polarity and perhaps for function. Now, the function of that polymerization is actually very obvious in human cells where um, the disheveled is part of the wind signaling pathway. So there, the protein undergoes um, condensate formation, so it makes puncta of high local protein concentrations. Now, if, it, uh, if the Dix domain is deleted, these uh, puncta are mostly gone. If we transplant the Arabidopsis soseki Dix domain on top of this protein, we can actually restore the localization and wind signaling in animal cells. So the domain is truly interchangeable. When we saw this puncta, we went back to our original observation of the Soseki localization, and we realized with high resolution microscopy that what we initially classified as polar patch of localization was in fact an agglomeration of small aggregates, condensates, very similar to disheveled localization. So perhaps these really are very similar proteins in their behavior. We next asked whether the human Dix domain could replace the one in Arabidopsis, and the result was very, uh, very clear. If we take the human Dix domain onto um, uh, an Arabidopsis soseki protein, this actually gives polarity back to a protein that is otherwise not polar. So these are structurally and functionally absolutely interchangeable domains in a plant and an animal polarity protein. Now, what is the role of that polymerization in disheveled? The reason that the protein polymerizes is thought to be to create high local protein concentration to overcome low affinity for its interactors. So by creating high concentration, it would allow proteins with a low affinity to disheveled to actually be recruited to disheveled, in this case, to the receptor for the wind ligand. So we asked whether that same biochemical principle is also true for Sosekis. And the first thing we did is to isolate proteins that associate with Soseki using a mass spectrometry based approach. And I'm going to show you our data on one of these proteins we identified, and this is called Angustifolia. Now, Angustifolia is an ortholog in plants of a protein that is called CTBP in animals. And that is an interactor, I'm sorry, that is an interactor of this protein here, axin, that also has a Dix domain. So there seems to be a nice convergence between the proteins that associate with. Uh, axin and with, um, with Soseki. Now, when we localize Angustifolia, we find it to be very broadly localized in cells. But if you look carefully, you can see that the protein is enriched at the edges of cells. 
And if we look even more closely, we can see that the protein localized in these puncta, very similar to Soseki. What we next asked is what happens if we now uh, provide excess Soseki? Uh, would that then also recruit Angustifolia to a different place? And the answer is yes. If we overexpress Soseki and we have abundant protein localization in corners, we also see Angustifolia co localized to those same corners. If we then remove the ability of Soseki to polymerize by removing the DIX domain, that also leads to a loss of Angustifolia localization to the corners. So in short, what this tells us is that Soseki actually recruits Angustifolia to cell corners by virtue of its ability to polymerize. Now that is summarized in this uh, a scheme here that is a, goes along with our recent paper on this. What we believe is that the concentration dependent polymerization of the Soseki protein through the DIX domain creates a polar scaffold that allows through its high concentration low affinity interactors such as angustifolia to be recruited to that corner. Now, let's, let's summarize here. Show you in this, in this short seminar is that maybe in contrast to expectations, a, a polarity protein is shared between animal and plant kingdoms. And I would dare you to, to actually find a difference between the Drosophila and the Shevold and the Marcantia Soseki localization in these images here. But more importantly, actually, between those proteins and between kingdoms, there seems to be a biochemical basis that is shared. Uh, that means polymerization of a scaffold protein to create high local concentration and recruit other proteins to that area. Now, of course, there's millions of questions and we are very eager to answer those, at least some of them. And I've listed a few of them here that we're working on currently. Of course, we would very much like to know what the biological functions are of Soseki proteins by means of loss of function genetics. We, of course, would like to know why and how Sosekis find the corners of cells. But beyond that, we're also very interested in defining the polar proteome of cells and asking how this connects to cell division orientation. And finally, uh, we're also very keen now knowing that there are conserved polarity proteins in the plant kingdom, we would like to find fundamental regulators of cell and organismal polarity. And I've been lucky to recently be able to recruit a very nice team. And this is a Teams meeting uh, screenshot of this morning uh, that are uh, currently working on various aspects of these questions. Now, um, I think I mentioned all the people involved in this project along the way, as well as our collaborators. And uh, these are our funders. I would like to thank all of you so much for taking your time to uh, listen uh, today. And I would, of course, be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dolph, for this uh, great talk. Um, I will put some questions here from the, from the audience. Um, and one question comes from uh, Pavi, Pavitran Narayanan. Um, and, and he wonders whether you guys know already um, if some post-translation modifications such as um, phosphorylation plays a role in, um, in the polar localization of the Soseki. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and that's also a very um, direction that we're very actively pursuing. What we are rather confident of is that the protein is uh, fatty or is acylated. There's a fatty acid modification that is necessary for the polar or for the membrane localization of the protein. This seems to be uh, the case. Uh, there's a conserved uh, cysteine that is probably modified for membrane localization. Um, there are many consensus motifs for phosphorylation. Uh, there's some other sites for uh, degradation. Um, there, and then we're currently looking at whether we can detect post-translational modifications on the protein. But, but there's definitely a lot of potential for that mechanism to, to be involved in polarization. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of, of questions. Um, well, for example, from Maria Florencia Ercoli. Um, uh, but also from Facundo uh, Romani. So they, they wonder about the developmental role and whether you can speculate on this. Um, if you give me time, I will speculate for as long as you want on this, uh, because we had years to think about it. It has so far been incredibly difficult to, to get loss of function information for these genes. Um, I, I will not bore you with all the details. Um, 
I think in terms of function, it is very obvious that it's already listening to some polarity information that pre-exists. So we don't believe that, that the Sosekis themselves are guiding polarity. Rather, we believe that they reinforce polarity. There is a positive feedback through the polarization that allows polarity cues to be amplified and, and other proteins to be, to be uh, located towards polar sites. So in terms of a cellular function, that's where we think um, uh, the action is. What the developmental function is, um, there's, that's, that's basically an open question. We see that any time that a new polarity axis is established uh, throughout development, one of the Sosekis is activated and marks the, the, the formation of that new polarity axis. So I would be surprised if there were no uh, role in that process, but it's, it's so far uh, I, I cannot base anything on, on actual, actual experimental data. Okay, so I, I will combine again uh, a couple of questions relating to the same thing, uh, and, and I was also wondering about this, so I, I may combine here Farid El Kasmi's questions and uh, combine it with Sebastian Schornack. So you show that uh, higher plants have several Sosekis and you call them cornerstone, right? But in Macancia there's only one, so that cannot be then really a cornerstone. And um, so what could be the function there? And uh, Sebastian Schornack is wondering whether the uh, Sosiki in Macancia is always looking towards the meristem notches. Yes. Um, well, as to the as to the name, of course, uh, the more we know, the more genes, of course, names are misnomers. Uh, that that's very sad. Um, uh, we were, of course, very gratified to to see that that at least there's something of a corner. But but what it what it is relative to is a very different question. Um, so yes. Well, whether actually, I have to be frank. I mean, what is a corner really? I mean, it's it, it's probably an edge and then it's enriched in the edge it's not only there it's it's so i have to be really honest and say that we don't even know if, if that corner is any meaningful it might simply be that uh, because of the geometric properties of that corner that's where the polymerization starts right so that's the the place where the protein accumulation starts something we're trying 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 to figure out at, at present um now then uh sebastian's question of whether it in Marcantia the protein always points towards the meristem notch or away from the meristem notch. Uh, as far as we can tell, yes, but this is of course only one context and, and there's uh, we're of course looking at the Marcantia Soseki in other contexts such as spore links. We're trying to understand whether uh, what actually is the guiding principle, whether that is again uh, a, a mechanical uh, input, whether it's the strain on the tissue, the tension on the membranes that is that is guiding this, which is of course very different in notches compared to other places in the in the GMA or in the thalus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. I mean, this also answers the question of Elena um, uh, Bena. She was also wondering whether the different pressures uh, in the cell wall would, would um, guide this, uh, this cell polarity. Uh, another interesting question from Michael Niemeyer, and he is wondering, uh, since you see these condensates of Soseki, uh, and he thought that uh, the condensates of ARF look suspiciously similar and whether there could be a connection. Well, the only connection I can, I can tell you here is that um, the uh, I guess about half of the proteins uh, in the universe have an intrinsically disordered region. So I, I guess we're going to see many, many more condensates in the future than we currently see. And maybe all of those cases where we, we dismissed uh, protein aggregates as being physiologically irre irrelevant will turn out to be more relevant than we think. So I would say that's the link. The other link is, of course, that Soseki 1 was isolated as a target of oxygen response signaling. But I, I don't think, other than that, there's, 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 there's any link between these processes. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I will combine two questions. So one is um, from uh, Barent de, de Graaf. And he wonders about the dynamics of, of, the, of the cornerstone localization. Um, and uh, the other one is from Jochen Long, and, and he wonders about the antagonistic localization of the different uh, Sosekis. Mm -hmm. And if you can comment. Yeah, these, are, these are both excellent questions. Um, the dynamics have been a little bit tricky to, to address because the, the uh, amount of the num amount of protein accumulation is extremely low when we don't overexpress. Um, so FRAP experiments, for example, have not yet been, been very um, successful. Uh, it is something that we hope to address now with inducible versions of the protein, so we have a bit more uh, room to play, as well as with cell cultures. 
um, where there's also not so much tissue influence anymore. So uh, it's absolutely something we're trying to figure out, but, but I can't really address the dynamics other than when we look at the, uh, the first couple of cells in the meristem, the protein is only there in three cells or so, and then it's gone. So it means that for sure the protein isn't very stable, and that I think can add to, to dynamic behavior. Um, the other question you have to help me, Yu Chen Long. Um, um, that was the antagonistic localization. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's actually a good point. Um, we see uh, the opposite localization of, of proteins, but that's in different cell types. Um, I don't think we have seen cases where there is antagonistic or opposite localization in the same cell type. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually a very easy experiment to do, and I wonder why we haven't done that with two differently labeled Sosekis in the same cell. So um, there are also, uh, there's one Soseki that is number three that is in all the corners uh, that co-localizes with everybody else. Uh, and we know from our biochemical data that these actually end up in complexes together. So I wouldn't consider that antagonistic, but rather uh, opposite localization that just happens to be in different cell types. But when you express the, um, the animal DIX domain, um, mm -hmm. or when you, when you basically um, inserted it, then you only got one localization, not the other, right? Or did I see that wrongly? Or was it also only in, in one particular cell type? Wait, so, I, uh, so actually you, you broke up, or I broke up halfway through your sentence. So you asked okay. me whether when you over, when you express the, the yes, go ahead. Yes, exactly. When you express the animal DIX um, domain, then you got only one, like the upper upper outer corner, and you didn't get the other one, yes. right? So that's actually true. But, but we used we used actually the the chassis of Soseki one. So um, what we found is, that, and that this is something that we published last year, is that the polar localization requires two domains. It requires one generic membrane association domain and one domain that, that, uh, that leads to uh, polarization, and that's the Dix domain. So the polarity itself, in broad terms, is defined by another domain, not the Dix domain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, great. Thanks a lot, Adolf. Um, I think for the sake of time, uh, we, we have to move on. And um, as always, so probably I, I have missed a lot of um, questions and, and it was really a long list, so I couldn't uh, un uh, um, put them forward um, all at once here. Um, but again, if you would like to ask something else, use the hashtag Planty Presents at, at Twitter and maybe at uh, Dolph's Twitter handle at Dolph Layers. Um, and I think we can um, continue discussing over there. Otherwise, um, okay. Dolph will also get the list of, of questions and, and he may also answer them and it will be posted at, at plantae.org. Thank you. Thank you, Dolph. Um, and All next right. up is um, Dana McGregor. Um, and Dana did her PhD in, uh, in Chicago and, uh, and afterwards she uh, moved to Europe and did a, a, a series of postdocs in the UK uh, where she showed a, a strong interest in, in control of circadian clock as well as uh, seed dormancy. And uh, she rather recently established her own lab in, in 2018, um, uh, now at, at uh, Rothamson Research. And in her independent studies, she's moving away from the model plant Arabidopsis and um, studies uh, black grass. And uh, we're very happy that she's today with us and uh, she's going to share her experiences with us. And uh, the title is uh, Bringing Agricultural Weeds into the Molecular Lab. So Dana, um, please, it's, it's all yours. Okay, great. Um, can, I, can you guys see my slides, yes? Yes, all good. Okay, excellent, great. Um, so I just wanted to, to start off by saying a huge thank you to um, the ASPB and to the Plante Presents team for, for putting together this great way to communicate science in the COVID-19 induced new normal that we find ourselves in. Uh, this is a great opportunity and I'm really excited to tell you a bit about what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, just as a warning, I plan to flip through my slides relatively quickly to give you guys as much visual input as possible. So if I do go too fast, just get in touch. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about things a little bit more slowly in more detail later. Um, so I don't know about you, but much of my, my quarantine time has been obsessing about food. Uh, where do I buy it? How do I get it home? How do I store it? What do I do with it? And, and how do I make it into something that's interesting, that's tasty and still fun? Um, just to highlight, the homemade mango ice cream was a big hit. 
Um, but really, this level of food insecurity is something that's relatively new to me, and I have to say it's been relatively unsettling. So my infamiliarity with, with not having enough food is due in part to, um, in large part, due to the fact that I've lived most of my life in Europe and in North America, where food insecurity is generally low, and this is a great thing. But if you look at the global picture, as illustrated here with data from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, in 2018, there were 697 million people who were categorized as either food insecure or severely food insecure in 2018. So this was a staggeringly big number when I found it, um, and it's unfortunately only predicted to get worse rather than better. So with increasing populations, with changes in food um, diet shifts, more crops going to alternative uses such as biofuels, really crop production needs need to at least double by 2050 in order to meet the needs. And although we've been doing a pretty good job at increasing yields over time of the major staple crops, the amount that's needed is not really matching the amount that are the current projections. So in short, um, really, in order to feed the world today and tomorrow, we need to make more food than we ever have over the next few years. And so um, the part of the reason that we're not making as much food as we ought to is because of these guys. So pests, diseases, and weeds are crop robbers, and they steal really significant portions of our, our yields every year. So today, I'm just going to focus on weeds, and I'm going to point out how these ubiquitous and pervasive pests cause significant loss to our yields. So to put some numbers to these statements, um, there was a poster presented through the Weed Science, Weed Science Society of America on data collected between 2017 and 2013, and they calculated the potential weed yield, wheat yield lost due to weed and the economic losses that were due to weeds in the U.S. and Canada. And their data showed that on average, the crops were uh, that um, the yields were lost by about a third. So about a third of the states lost um, about a third of the yield was lost in each of the states. And some of the states, like Minnesota, they lost nearly half of their crop. So these numbers are really quite surprising, but when you sum this up across North America, they're staggering. So those 400 million bushels of wheat are actually larger than the entire Kansas crop of 2015. And when you move that to something that means a little bit more to somebody like me who relies on sandwiches, that's almost 100 billion sandwiches. So really, weeds are significant um, reasons why we are not pr providing as much food as we ought to. And weeds cause significant reductions to our crop yields every year. And by removing them, we can significantly increase our ability to feed the world today and tomorrow. So really what we need are more of the fields like this one here on the right compared to this one here on the left. And of course, the reason that we're able to have fields like the one on the right is because we've used herbicides on it. So herbicides are agrochemicals that are specifically designed to kill the weeds without harming the crops. And they do this by targeting um, major pathways in the plants, such as photosynthesis, cellular metabolism, or cell division and growth. And um, we, they've been in use uh, really heavily since the 1940s, and they've been key to our ability to, to undertake a large monocultural crop growth uh, in a way that's sort of economically cost-effective. And we have really relied on them. In the UK alone, 100, um, there was last year, there was 10,000 tons of active ingredients were sold in the UK. And they work, well, mostly. Um, plants are smart, plants are actually wicked smart. And since the 1970s, there's been a linear and steady increase in the, in the cases of, of herbicide resistant weeds that have been registered. Um, and this is um, happening because plants are finding ways to get around these, these, deadly pe um, these deadly chemicals and they're surviving them. So in the UK, we actually have a very small handful of problematic agricultural weeds. And the ones marked here with the red borders have recorded herbicide resistances. But really, there's one weed that stands out. And it's not just because I've highlighted it in purple. But um, this black grass, Alipocarsis myrosides, is really the major problem weed for winter cereal farmers in the UK and Western Europe. And its um, herbicide resistance, Alipocaris, has, has, uh, is across much of Western Europe, from Spain all the way up to Sweden. And where it's present, it really does cause significant problems. So in the UK alone, there was a recent study that showed that this one weed leads to nearly half a billion pounds of lost income to farmers. And the yield losses that are due to this equate to 1.2 billion loaves of bread. So if we're going to grow enough food to feed everyone in 2050, eliminating black grass is a very good place to start. But um, the way that I look at black grass is perhaps a bit different than uh, how many other people are working on this weed. And this is where my, my title comes into this in bringing agricultural weeds into the, into the molecular lab. 
And in large part, my approach to blackgrass is colored by the fact that I've spent most of my scientific career investigating what it is that allows plants to survive. So I'm trained as an Arabidopsis molecular geneticist, and my work has really been investigating how plants mount the appropriate developmental outputs in response to the environmental challenges. My work has been aimed at characterizing the molecular responses that lead to the, uh, in, the, the interface between the environmental input and the appropriate developmental input. And what I've been focusing on is how these work so that the plant or their offspring can, can survive. So my switch from Arabidopsis to Alipicaris was actually relatively straightforward because weeds like blackgrass are exceedingly good at surviving even when they shouldn't. So Roth has said, what I'm doing here is I'm taking all of this accumulated knowledge and I'm applying it to blackgrass to try and understand how it survives in its agro, agro environment. So how does it manage to survive in this agro environmental challenges and what are the molecular responses that are, that are happening? So what I'm trying to do is by understanding blackgrass, I can find weaknesses that of course can be then exploited. Um, so I do miss working on uh, model organisms. Uh, there are definitely some challenges that are associated on when working with non-model organisms, um, but actually I've been pretty lucky with blackgrass. There was already a community of researchers working on it and they'd already proved that it was experimental attractable, that it was amenable to experimental manipulation. And at Rotham said there was a collaboration that had just, just finished when I joined and it was, um, it, it was a, they were gathering a huge number of well-characterized natural populations from all over England. So I actually do have a good, well-characterized nat natural population bank to go to. Um, that said, there's very little access to omics data, some transcriptomics and proteomics, but no genome, no metabolome, certainly nothing like the huge searchable databases that are available for Arabidopsis. But most surprisingly, there's no publications that mention genetic manipulation, not just of blackgrass, but of any weed species. So omics and GM techniques were two things that I couldn't imagine living without. So this is where I decided to put my efforts. I'm very pleased to say that in collaboration with colleagues at Bayer and at Clemson University, we're sequencing and annotating a blackgrass genome. This is very, very exciting, and I don't think I need to spend much time on explaining how enabling a genome will be to the plant egg community. We've made a lot of progress completing this genome, and we have a very good biological story to go with it. So I hope that the results of this huge collaborative effort will be out in the not too distant future. But fortunately, I'm not actually the one who's doing the sequencing and annotation. And so this means that I've had time to focus on setting up methods to manipulate gene expression in blackgrass. Although there's many different techniques that I could have used, I chose to use virus-mediated gene modification techniques. These are dominant and transient, and it's the presence of the plant cell that changes the expression. Uh, they also happen to be very flexible, uh, because depending on the viral vector that's used and the insert that goes into it, it's possible to induce both gain and loss of functions in planta. And it, it seems like a really strange time to be talking about how useful viruses are, uh, so please forgive my timing. Um, for those of you that haven't heard about these techniques before, they are actually um, transient reverse genetics techniques that use endogenous plant interactions uh, with the virus to alter gene expression. And they've been around since the mid-1990s, really. Um, but before I get too much into the techniques, I just wanted to remind you how plants and viruses normally interact. Viruses, of course, can't replicate themselves, but instead they rely on the, the plant's machinery to produce more viruses. So viruses release their genetics into this cell and they co-opt the, the plant's translational machinery to make more, more proteins so that they can replicate the genome as well as the outer protein shell that the genomes go into. These are then released, they infect another cell, and the cycle repeats. But plants are not just passive victims and they've developed pathways to prevent vi against the viral infections. So plants uh, recognize the viral DNA RNA because it's double-stranded and they recruit a protein complex called DICER so DICER cleaves the, the double-stranded RNA into pieces called small interfering RNAs. These small interfering RNAs are loaded into the risk complex, and the risk complex goes and finds the corresponding mRNA that's in the cell, and it cleaves it into tiny little pieces so that the mRNA can no longer be made into protein. So the direction of risk to, to digest, or to cleave the mRNA is based on base pairing matching between the siRNA and the target. So you can see how this is uh, this elegant and very efficient system might be very useful for me to, to uh, do some gene expression changes in plants. So virus-induced gene silencing, or VIGS, uses a modified virus to deliver a piece of double-stranded RNA into the cell, which then causes the endogenous target gene to be degraded through the silencing pathway. So I put a little piece of the plant uh, genome in here, you put it in an antisense, and it makes sure that the endogenous copy of the RNA is being degraded as well as the copy that's being delivered by the 
um, by the virus. So the system has been developed, of course, to work on crop plants and model plants, and it works quite well. There's a number of different viral systems that are out there and different um, that have been published to work. So one of the first genes that had been targeted this way is phytoene desaturase, or PDS, and it's still routinely used as positive control. And the reason that we use it is because loss of PDS res results in photobleaching of the leaves because the, uh, this gene is essential for production of chlorophyll as well as for carotenes and, and beta carotenes and other things that make up the color of the plant. So this is a, a very easy visual phenotype. So of course I tried this first. I made a Viggs virus that targeted the black grass PDS gene and infected black grass with it. And what you can see is here. So compared to the plants infected with just the virus that contains the multiple cloning site here on the left-hand side of your screen, what you can see is the, what, the ones on the right have white stripy leaves. This was just what I was looking for and I was very excited when I saw these results. It's um, incredibly hard to photograph, so I'll zoom in here on one of the leaves. Uh, hopefully, even those of you with terrible internet connections can see that the infection of the Viggs virus targeting the black grass PDS results in photobleaching of the leaves. The fact that the whole leaf isn't white is one of the limitations of Viggs. It um, doesn't ever re result in uniform silencing of the gene through an infected plant or equal levels between plants, but the effect is quite obvious. And when I grind up the whole plant and measure the amount of PDS mRNA in the whole plant by qPCR, the reduction in the total mRNA with the virus infection is quite substantial. So these results demonstrate that the loss of function mutations are now possible in black grass using Viggs. But remember, I told you that virus-mediated gene modifications was flexible, and I could induce both loss and gain of function mutations. So now I'll move over to gain of function. So virus-mediated overexpression, or VOX, actually uses the, um, an adapted virus to deliver a new mRNA directly into the plant cell where it's made. So remember that I said that the virus infects, it releases its, its genome, and then it co-ops the machinery of the plant to create its own proteins. Well, what we do with Vox is that we insert the mRNA of interest into the virus, where it uh, then creates the, the protein of interest. Uh, so um, unsurprisingly, uh, GFP is a very lovely thing to use here because it's also a readily visible phenotype, and it's also something that's very well characterized. It's a small protein. And basically, uh, there were, um, this is a good way to get started. So what I used was the published ve vectors that were uh, for wheat, and here are the results. So unlike the plants on the left, where you can see the invected Vox virus with just the in multiple cloning site, the ones on the right are glowing with a characteristic GFP fluorescence. Again, not every cell in every leaf or every leaf is glowing, but that Vox works in black grass is unequivocal. Uh, again, I have all the molecular backing to show that this is a true virus-mediated heterologous expression of GFP, but I won't show those data here. So um, although glowing black grass is pretty cool, it doesn't help me to er eradicate it from the farmer's fields. And what I needed was a way to look at phenotypes that were associated directly with its ability to be a good weed. So remember that I started off my talk by explaining to you that one of the key advantages that black grass has is that it exhibits widespread resistance to multiple herbicides. Uh, so like many Arabidopsis geneticists, the only herbicide that I had any familiarity with was Basta. Uh, it has many different trade names and its official name is glufosinate. Uh, and I, the reason I knew about Basta was because like many others, I'd used the Basta resistance gene from Streptomyces to select my transgenic plants. So when the single gene is expressed, uh, usually by a single insert that's, that's infected by a bacteria, uh, it confers trans uh, resistance to glufosinate herbicides. So you can see here in the pictures on the right, there's one that's surviving. Um, and this is a very useful trait. And so I thought it might be useful in my Vox vectors. So what I did was I made a Vox vector that carried the Boston resistance gene, and I tested whether or not this would be sufficient to confer additional herbicide resistances to black grass. So the first bit of good news is that uh, when I spray enough Bosta onto black grass, it does die compared to the unsprayed control. Uh, so you can see this is my lovely dead plant. Um, the GFP driven by Vox wasn't enough to confer resistance, uh, uh, but when I, when I infect plants with the Vox bar virus, they do survive the Bosta treatment. I often refer to this as my no statistics needed slide, and hopefully you agree with me that this really nice result clearly demonstrates that it's possible to assess whether single genes are sufficient to confer herbicide resistance to black grass. Okay, so in summary, what I've told you so far is that virus-mediated gene modification systems do work in black grass, and I can use them to induce both loss and gain of functions and mutations transiently. 
Uh, and I can also use these to test whether particular genes are necessary for black grass's ability to survive herbicide resistant sprays. So this is a very enabling technology and it allows for the first time to explore genotype phenotype relationships in black grass. And it's a major step change away from the in vitro heterologous systems that are typically used to explore function of weed genes. So now that these techniques were working, I wanted to see whether or not they, they could be used to explore the causes of herbicide sensitivity in black grass. So in the black grass literature, there's really just one protein that's gained a lot of attention. Remember I said that there was limited, limited proteomics and transcriptomics data. And what these have all sort of converged around is a glutathione S transferase called AMGSTF1. And this protein is overrepresented in some of the herbicide resistant populations. So for the purpose of this talk, all you need to know about AMGSTF1 is that in many biotypes, the level of a plant protein correlates the amount of resistance that it has. So populations with low levels of AMGSTF1 are sensitive, and those with high levels of AMGSTF1 are resistant. So targeting this protein therefore seemed like a really great place to start to see whether or not I could use VIGS to do functional validation of black grass genes. So I started testing this by using two different biotypes of black grass, a resistant one known to have high levels of AMGSTF1, where there isn't much difference between the unsprayed plants and the, the, the plants that were sprayed with just treated with the multiple cloning site, as you can see by fresh weight, and a sensitive plant where you can, um, the, there's major differences in fresh weight when they've been sprayed. And you can see this as well in the pictures. Uh, I've rather given the punchline away with the title of my slide here, but when I treat these biotypes with a VIGS vector targeting AMGSTF1, the resistant one is much less resistant to the herbicide treatment. And in fact, it looks like, and it's fresh weight, it's not statistically significantly different from the sensitive plants. So this clearly shows an important role that this protein plays in conferring herbicide resistance to this biotype. And it also demonstrates that VIGS is suitable for testing genotype phenotype hypotheses about herbicide resistances in black grass. But before you get too excited and roll out the newspaper headlines saying that I've come up with a solution for black grass, we know that there's multiple different types of resistance in black grass and AMGSDF1 isn't underpinning all of them. Furthermore, these VIGS and VOCT vectors were developed to test hypotheses in barley and wheat, the very crops within which black grass grows. And these plants um, actually survive herbicide treatments typically through detoxification of the herbicide by enzymes such as glutathione S, tri S transferases like AMGSTF1. So if I was to go out and use these vectors in the field, they would probably be infect the crop and make them susceptible to the herbicides. So all in all, not the desired outcome. However, remember that my main aim actually was to bring this agricultural weed back into the molecular lab and take some steps towards generating omics and GM techniques. So having the genome and an ability to induce both gain and loss of function mutations will be incredibly enabling, especially where I've already demonstrated that they are uh, applicable to demonstrating uh, whether or not a particular gene is sufficient or necessary for the gain and loss for the herbicide resistance phenotypes. So when it comes to weeds, uh, despite the fact that there are 262 species of weeds with recorded instances of herbicide resistance, there's only 12 species with published genomes and no other accounts of whole plant transformation. So although many of you might think that um, just having a genome and being able to change some gene expression is actually a relatively insignificant achievement, this is a huge deal to weed science. And actually it's going to be really quite good for actually bringing these, bringing these weeds into the molecular lab and starting to do some, some really hypothesis level questions on molecular level, getting molecular level answers. So to wrap all of this up, I've introduced you to my favorite weed today and told you that black grass is a real threat to food security. Uh, following the wisdom of know your enemy, uh, what I'm, the, the, the approach that I'm taking is that by understanding the mechanisms that are underlying herbicide resistances will allow for effective and sustainable weed management strategies to be designed. But to gain the required mechanistic understanding of herbicide resistances, we must first know what's in this plant and be able to do experiments where we functionally validate genes of interest and test hypotheses relating to gene function. So the genome and the Viggs box techniques that I've shown you today are really important steps towards that goal. So if you want to know more about the Viggs box work that I presented today, it was published in April in Plant Physiology, and the people named here in red are the ones who directly contributed to that. I'd also like to acknowledge a number of other people and the Blackgrass team here at Rothamsted. And of course, none of this would have been po possible without the financial support of the Smart Crop Protection Program awarded to Rothamsted and the support of my fellowship through the NA Agri-Food Resilience Program. 
Uh, again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the Plantape platform for this opportunity to talk to you today. And I hope that I haven't gone too fast so I can still leave a little bit of time for sharing some questions. Thank you, Dana. Perfectly in time. Very nice and interesting talk and um, a very nice journey to, to show also how it is to, to switch from model organisms um, to, to such an important question for agriculture. Um, I, will, I will ask you a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, and the, the first one here is actually an uh, ecological one. So um, Alexandra Sakiva is wondering whether growing different species of crops on the same field um, increases the overall resistance to, to weeds through eliminating their environmental niche? Yes, so integrated pest management um, or crop rotations are really essential to manage the way in which the, the weed populations are, are established and maintained. Um, it, as you can imagine, if you grow the same thing over and over again, then the weeds will get used to being in that environment and they will do quite well in that space. Um, one of the main ways that we actually do deal with with blackgrass at the moment is through changing the crop rotations. Mm -hmm. um, another question is actually related to the techniques that you're using. Um, so G Shu is wondering how you deliver the VIX and VOX system into the blackgrass. Um, there's, yeah, there's two different ways that um, I can explain this. Uh, but really, in short, what we do is we uh, create the virus uh, through bulking it up in um, through um, infiltration of the virus into tobacco. And then you get a really nice big fat leaf that's full of virus. So the virus is made originally in tobacco. And then you use that as an inoculum to infect the, the black grass leaves. Uh, and we actually do that by creating small nicks on the, the leaf surface through rubbing it with carborundum and some sort of uh, sharp um, sand type uh, and then basically just use your fingers to introduce the, um, the, the sap directly into the, into the plant. So it's actually a rub inoculation and it's done through infiltration via tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Hugard is, is wondering whether this technology could be also applied in, in the field and if you could um, study, well, basically phenotypes in the field. Um, if you had a field that was completely isolated, Probably. The problem with these is that you're using a, a transgenic virus. Uh, so there's um, all sorts of questions. There's, there's technological questions of can it work? There's uh, ethical questions of do you want to be rubbing a transgenic virus on plants in the field? Um, there's, there's actually, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why it may not be possible to do it. Um, but, uh, in, you know, fundamentally a plant growing in a greenhouse is behaving very similar to plants growing in the field. So you know, I don't see that there's any fundamental science that says that it can't happen, but there's lots and lots of questions about should we do it, how do we do it, how do we control it, how do we make sure it's specific, you know, but but yeah, that, that sort of thing. Um, I think uh, if the regulations were available, if the safety was available, if the um, opportunities were there, it would, it could be possible, but mm -hmm. yeah. So Yasteep Singh is, is wondering um, how you would um, get from genomic and transcriptomic um, data uh, to herbicide resistance information. Yeah, so um, there's part of the, the lovely thing that I mentioned with the different natural populations is that those have a range of different herbicide resistances. Uh, so it's not just a black or white thing where you're either resistant or you're not, but there's a whole range of different phenotypes that are occurring in between there. Uh, and the transcriptomic data that we've that we've generated actually covers that whole range. So I have everything that's completely sensitive all the way up to very, very resistant. So the idea is that by, by finding the differences between each of those, and comparing the differences between sort of mostly sensitive and mostly resistant, we can try and figure out what genes might be happening. The lovely thing about the Viggs and Vox systems is that they're actually relatively high throughput. So you're creating a single vector that then goes into making a virus, the virus then you can infect. So, so it is relatively high throughput. So even if we had a ton of genes, uh, if I had a ton of people, we could just crank through this and it would be, be okay to test a lot of different things. It's not like making a transgenic plant where you, you know, you've got three year wait before you have your final product. Um, we're talking about months rather than years before you can test the phenotype. Mm -hmm. So Tino Thomas is wondering about off-target silencing using VIX. 
so that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so if you, because you're essentially, the silencing is occurring because you have a 21 MER. So depending on how you pick that 21 MER, uh, you can either target only one gene, because it's easy to get a 21 MER that is specific to your gene of interest, or if you take a large enough piece or a piece that's conserved well enough, you could knock out the whole family. So uh, these are, there's been lots of studies that have, that have asked about this, and this is part of the reason that we need the genome first, is because in Blackgrass, we're actually not sure what's in there, how many copies of things, what are the differences. Um, but once we have the genome, we can start to, to figure these, these out and test systematically, uh, you know, if we put in this region, what's causing it. Um, in the VIX vectors, typically what we put in is a piece that's somewhere between 150 and 250 base pairs. And so you can choose that piece either to target a single gene or a whole family of genes. Mm -hmm. um, Paula McSteen is, is trying to push the whole story to, towards auxin and, and wonders whether um, there are also instances of auxin herbicide resistances in, in blackgrass. Um, and if so, is there any ideas about the mechanism? Uh, synthetic auxins. Um, yes, there's, there's all sorts of um, interesting work that's being done on auxinic herbicides. Uh, fortunately, they aren't used uh, predominantly on wheat um, in, the, in the UK, uh, and many of the herbicide resistances to auxin are in other species. So I don't have to worry about auxin uh, in this particular species. So that's, that's uh, for, for once, I'm not working on auxin. Okay. Um, Alejandro Aragon is, is wondering about um, chemicals. Um, I guess it, it relates to the fact that uh, people saw this nice correlation between the AMGSTF1 levels, right? And whether one couldn't just look for chemicals that um, kind of suppress these levels and uh, and change there for the the resistance. Yeah, so there's some lovely chemicals that really nicely inhibit GSTs and GST behavior, but um, AMGSTF1 is in the fee class, there's tau classes, there's tons of different families of GSTs, uh, and getting specificity to interact with a single GST in that whole family has been a little bit complicated. There is a group that's working on, on things similar to that, and they are looking for specific bits that's at Newcastle. Uh, and some of the other people around in the UK are also looking for, for specific uh, targets. Um, but as I said, AMGSTF1 isn't the whole story. We know that uh, the correlate, there are levels that are correlated uh, and protein levels that, that um, if you have high levels of AMGSTF1, you're likely to have resistance. But there are times when you have low levels of AMGSTF1 and you still have resistance. So it's not the whole story. So even if we could find a specific in inhibitor for just AMGSTF1, it may not solve the problem. But yes, there are some, there's GSD inhibitors. They do work to reverse herbicide resistance in some of the biotypes, um, but they also create all sorts of other problems. And as I said, the crops are actually detoxifying these herbicides through similar mechanisms. So if you were to inhibit all GSTs, you would probably kill your crop as well as killing your weeds. Evgenia mm -hmm. Puk. Uh, um, is, is wondering whether you can use Arabidopsis to, to figure out um, resistance in, in blackgrass. So I guess like what happens if you express AMG's TF1 in Arabidopsis, does it, does it um, induce resistance? Yes, it does. I didn't do that work, which is lovely. Um, yeah, so that's actually, that was done um, a few years ago, actually, when, as I said, the only way to study plant, uh, the only way to study weed gene functions at the moment is actually through heterologous expression systems. So when they found AMGSTF1, they put it into Arabidopsis, and yes, it does alter the herbicide specificity. But you're talking about blackgrass, which is this huge monocot and it grows in fields compared to the teeny tiny Arabidopsis, which is a dicot and it's uh, totally different behaviors. So actually, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges at that point. Um, but you can test uh, the expression levels and you can, you can heterologously express it and see that there are differences. Um, but you're, you're, you, know, you are comparing apples to oranges, and so it's much, much better to compare gene function in the species of interest. Not only that, but actually VIGs and VOX are faster than creating transgenic Arabidopsis. So if I'm going to do anything high throughput and I'm going to look through anything that's uh, more than just a single gene, uh, it's better to do it with the virus-mediated gene expression systems than it is through Arabidopsis. 
-hmm. I still do have some Arabidopsis seeds kicking around though, so it's one of those things that uh, if I end up finding a gene of interest, I will probably express it in uh, alter it in, in Arabidopsis and go through that way too. Sounds like a plan. I All can right. never leave Arabidopsis. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dana, for this uh, very nice talk and, and also very interesting uh, discussion. Um, and again, if you feel like um, keeping on discussing, please use Twitter with the Plante Presents ha um, hashtag and the Twitter handle uh, of Dana is uh, plant, uh, at PlantENV. It's probably for plant environment. environment. Yeah. Um, okay, great. I think we, we saw two really, really nice talks um, with, with different complexity and Dolph showed um, how nice it is to have all this, this information from the animals, but how difficult it is still to, to study cell polarity in plants. And Dana showed how nice it is to have these model plants and how really difficult it is um, once you, you leave this, um, this, uh, this path of a model plant. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for joining us. And uh, I will hand it over to, to Katie to, to say farewell. Thank you to both of our speakers and thanks for joining us. Um, the recording will be posted in the next couple of days and you'll receive an email with the certificate of attendance as well as the links to recordings and other, other events in the series. Thank you and I look forward to you having us join us next time. <laughs>